Let's read some of this on page, um, questions? On page six. Yes, but with a writer, the form, in quotes, the ideal form of the conversation is entirely different, which means that it is not really a matter of arriving at the truth of content, of the theses of the book, but rather, you know, a little bit of economy, but rather a question of coming to grips with new effects produced by the new situation of a joint discussion. And there will be no attempt then, in the book we are trying to produce now, to tell the truth of the little bit of economy. So when I said that, I made that truth statement, um, um, political economy will not work because it, it, uh, Marx did not take into consideration a little bit of economy. That can be seen as a truth statement. But it's one that I can't stop at because there, there have to be, there are many other, what is economy? What it generally means is resources. Yeah, exchange of resources. Yeah, resources, or different kinds of resources. Different kinds of uh, energies, rhythms, and so on. That are really Bataille is, is the one who has been so important in terms of economies. The restricted economy. Determinate, restricted economy, and a general economy. Okay. He has three volumes, the accursed chair. You need to read at least the first volume. Because the influence that he has had on all of these people is major, major, major. Okay. <clears throat> and so when you get the general literature in there, immediately I thought in his point of view. Bataille. The problem with Bataille is that he believed in sacrificial economy and therefore people like Nazi and others could not, could not go with sacrifices at all. So they're trying to create a book here that's not a book, about a book, in this conversation. That's what Leotard wants to do, create something new. So it's not about mastery either, okay? Because once the words are, are, are spoken or written, they take on a lot, it's a, it's a, a coup de day, it's the throw of the dice, okay? They can mean pretty much whatever. Now, for some people uh, with certain temperaments, does this mean that really anything goes? <coughs> If it's productive, if you let it be productive, maybe so. so okay. This is not an extreme. And don't, please don't accept, that, accept this or read this as an extreme form of, um, what's the other word that she's going to use? Where you can't know anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, okay, all right, good, that's a good word. Okay. Uh, you have three kinds of nihilism. Okay. There, and people forget this when they talk about Nietzsche. But you there is three. There's passive nihilism, where you sit there and you suffer. There's active <coughs> nihilism, nihilism, and unbeknownst to Aristotle, that's what he's doing. And then you have accomplished nihilism, which means nihilism, nothing has become everything. It goes back to what you were saying about the you know, value, or, or trying to affix a value, which it says, you know, there's no value in nature. We impose the value on mm -hmm. nature. And then you mentioned Emerson earlier, and I was thinking of his, you know, there, there are no fixtures in nature. We just talk about fix to it. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing that we have to say about Emerson is that he is a transcendentalist. Yeah. You know, and none of these people can, can go that right on anymore. <coughs> you know, I can't read, I can't find that, I can't read the whole book to you, can I? Let's see. Okay, so first day opens with having been spoken to, okay. He is not the addresser, but he's the addressee. He's been hailed to be the addressee. And that is what? What does the addressee do? Speaker, audience. What is the, or listener? What is it that the addressee does? He listens. 
Who's the great listener in uh, pre-Platonic uh, pre philosophy? Notice I said pre -Platonic. I didn't say pre-Socratic, I said pre-Platonic. <clears throat> Who is the great listener? Heraclitus. He spent his lifetime listening. What was his relation to, to the Logos? Listening to the Logos. A lifetime. Concealing, unconcealing. Concealing, unconcealing. Concealing, unconcealing. So, what kind of philosopher is a person who listens instead of who has mastered thinking? Someone who's an, an accomplished um, nihilist and someone who is um, arrogant. Okay, so the talk opens with a libido uh, economy as a scandal. All rhetoric. It's all rhetoric. If it is all rhetoric, then you should be able to argue with it. So we have the misuse of the word here. Opens, however, as a parody of, is this a parody? Of Plato's Asophist. We've talked about that. Opens with theory fiction. Continues with distinctions among classicism, romanticism, modernism. And we know, given footnote 16, okay, and, uh, the footnote on page 16, that uh, modernism is postmodernism, romanticism is modernism, classicism is reality. Okay. Then you have this diagram here, which is probably confusing as hell because I put all of these contradictory statements down in terms of address or addressee codes, references, and so on. Okay. Um, then on page 16 and 17, let's turn to the situation. Every time I read this, I jump out of my pants. <laughs> Fourth line down for the top 16. But I wanted to add that when I speak of paganism, I am not using a concept. What does a concept uh, refer to? God, do we go to one? Yeah. What is it, what is it that a concept refers to? A proposition. Traditional philosophy. It is a name neither better nor worse than others, paganism, for the denomination of a situation in which one judges without criteria. Okay. How does it make a judgment without criteria? Well, you have to have criteria, so you make it up at that particular moment. And when we come back, you'll see an example uh, it, from a film, okay, Bang the Drum, put it loudly, softly, whatever it is. <laughs> and um, it, it, the, the name of the game is Tag War, T E G W A R. And it's a card game, and you make up the rules as you go along. And what is at work is the rules are believable, or you're swept away by them if they are just ingenious, and you go with them. If they're not, you don't go with them. So you'll have five people playing cards, right? and the rules are changing constantly. And the whole object is to create the most wonderful game, okay, with all these rules. And it parallels with the game of baseball, minor league baseball. And it parallels with death. The central character who plays Tegwa, this is his, his invention, is dying. He finds out he's dying. And he goes into the season to play anyway. <clears throat> and we're, we're only going to show you the very beginning of this when he's trying to show it to his dad. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting. There are a number of different scenes. And the game, a teguar, at times is thought of as a confidence game. It can be used for evil. But is there anyone who's not a confidence man of some kind? Or mm -hmm. Have you read Melville's novel, The Confidence Man? It's not all negative. It's like very positive. It's what you need in modernity to be able to get through the day is a confidence. You have to be a confidence man yourself. Okay, we're out of time then. So, you're responsible for this book, and there will be a test. <laughs> as soon as you get back from. But we have another, what, three hours? Do you know? So you're going to come in and you're going to have very specific questions based on notes or your notes. I told you, here are my notes. And didn't I say this in the, in the email? What, where, where are your notes? Okay. Let's go get to
in the chat. <laughs> the Pagan. The Pagan game. Remember, there are three games. But the Parmenides game, the Moses game, and the Pagan game. Um, and we have only touched upon the middle one, the Moses game, and uh, have yet to get into. So we're showing this strip a little early. Uh, the Pagan game. So, um, we're going to start with credits and everything. The, the, the uh, setting is um, baseball, minor league baseball. Okay. Uh, and you, once you get into the pair, you come to understand that the Nero, the, the hero, is dying. Okay. But he goes back to, back to play baseball. And to, it opens with a scene eventually when, we, when, when he meets his friends. Okay. It opens with a scene uh, with his father. And, and his friend, and they're playing um, tech war. And his father's at the cross. So there are no rules. You make up the rules as you go along. There are no criteria. Okay, so all the criteria made up as you go along. In uh, the game of Tech War, when it's introduced, reintroduced into the film, as I said, uh, takes on different um, permutations and combinations. It's really, it's quite interesting how it informs uh, everything. Okay, and towards the end, after he's dead, just sitting there playing the game. So it's about community in many different ways as well. Though the film can undercut some of that because it tends to be sentimental. How do you deal with death? Usually it's through sentimentality or brute force, you know, the ugliness of it. And so on. Any questions about that? Uh, to clarify, is it about not having criteria or is it about not having universal criteria? Um, okay, so if the, the game is, as a game, would be defined by um, certain rules, right? So I guess those would be universal. But there's some games that you can bend the rules, so, right? <clears throat> um, and if you are um, a good player, you'll know how to bend the rules, okay, without fouling or anything. Um, but the rules are to be made up and you go on. Yeah. It would be interesting to have a cinema on those rules. Yeah. And would that have to do with changing the concept of time from the chronos to the I don't know how you say it in English, but I'm going to say it in Latin, kairos, where okay. you do not, you, there's no possibility of, of predetermining anything or 
having any kind of strategy. Games usually include quotation marks, some kind of strategy. Well, if you go with Kairos, uh, you allow the circumstances to let you, they, they lead you to the possible options that you, you take. So, so it's more of a tactic game than a strategic game. Very, very well put. Yeah, it's tactics instead of strategy. The, as far as time goes, it's, um, it is made up of um, moments, instead of chronological time, okay. which is mechanical. Yeah, the chronos. Tick tock, okay. And it's, it's measured off, that's the logic of the cut. We're going back to the logic of the cut. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then it's tick tock again, what about right here? But we're like waiting. You know, if you really stop about and think about time and become self-conscious about time, you hear tick talking. Is it coming back? It's like going to sleep. Will it be here? Will it, whatever it is, in the morning when I wake up and so on. Okay. But the time that you mentioned, yeah, Oh, Kairos, that's the, the Greek, um, is defined in two ways. One is sort of is a, 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 an anemic way of thinking about it, as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> the other is um, um, a destructive time, as opposed to a time of devastation. Destruction would be um, what has to happen for things to change. Okay? Um, how do you make a, a difference between devastation and destruction? And, and Derrida, of course, picks it up. Uh, so this can be both an opportune moment, you know, timing is everything. You have to make your speech at a particular point in time. You don't know precisely when, but you can try, you know, to guess what would be the moment to do it. And people act then. If you give it a day too early, a day later, it's just too late. It won't work. So time factors into to persuasion or convincing people as well. Now, what's going to happen? We were not supposed to meet tomorrow. But we're meeting tomorrow. That changes. It changes everything. Um, and then the other is, how does the film open? It opens with a chirotic moment. You see Mayo Clinic when you and her. Uh-oh. Then they get when they're fishing, which is another ritual. <coughs> that, well, when they're driving in the car, you know, there's, a, there's a voiceover. And, and he's, Moriarty says he's been his roommate, you know, and, and um, he lists all of his virtues and, and vices and, and so on. Uh, and he does so with, with, um, with love. Uh, but we know that uh, the, the story begins with a chirotic moment, or er, 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 again. The event that tears time. It disrupts time. Um, this is the time of uh, the Cesara. That word has been used. You know what Cesara is. <clears throat> In the middle of a line of poetry, you want the line to stop. Normally, the poems will go to the end of the line, and there's a comma there, and then you stop, and then you read this line. Okay, Cesara is an interruption. person who uses that term is <coughs> the Pool of Art, okay, and um, Jean Luc uses it as well. And is, well, I, I don't want to take you out of the subject, but is that then the way that Derrida uh, uh, wrote the postcard? Yeah. Well, look at Glaw. Glaw as well, yeah. I mean, it doesn't flow, you know, you read this and what's wrong with it? And you find it sometimes, okay. So, but that, but, but there's a model for that. It's a Hebraic book, okay. With all the marginalia and, and the what is it called? The oh God, is it Talmud? Yeah, no, not that. I'm talking about the writing. It, there is oh. palimpsest, palimpsest, where you would paint over. Um, palimpsest, palimpsest. Yeah, pal yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I love to mispronounce words. I just don't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 
terrible speller too, but I tried to turn the vices into the virtues. The mark of the autodidact, the mispronunciation. Yeah. It shows you're reading, you're not hearing it. It's a good sign. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you have any questions about what's been said you know, earlier today? Um, thoughts, moments, um, concerns? Um, are you upset? If so, that's good. It's, you know, are you beside yourself? Are you ecstasis or something like that? Ecstasis. Well, okay. <laughs> we talk about stasis theory. You know, it's, it's uh, grounding. In X. Stasis. Since there's no grounding, or there are moments when there is no grounding, you are, the expression is, he was beside himself. He saw it. Out of himself. He saw it. Um, and it's very common to not use the word subject anymore, but a singularity or a radical individuality or whatever. And it's... Um, uh, in that static moment. Okay. And yeah, it does get mixed up with the drug ecstasy. So. Others? You want to sit a little bit? Sure. Nick, can you can sit there? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can't hey, you sit right here. <laughs> An event in uh, a time of modernity, you know, the voice of authority, parmenides. I know, I, I, I'm the one who's writing the first thought about being, okay. That's foundational. And, um, and then the second one is um, Hebraic, Jewish, it's Moses, and so on. And he does not want it set there. I mean, he could do some really interesting things there, but, you know, um, we have other people later doing interesting things. Well, Levinas, you know, in contemporary, he's doing it, so he doesn't want to do that. And what he wants is the idea of pagans, okay, where there is no central God, no, no matter, central human being are central, like, communities, godlike, okay, are um, a god, okay, uh, an Old Testament, uh, Old Testament god, or, or any god that would be the one, the one. So he goes to the model um, of the pagan gods. There are many gods. No one's in charge. They're all fighting each other. N not a single one of them has a meta-linguistic position from which to make a judgment, to know what's going on. <coughs> they they uh, play games. They, you know, it's ruse after ruse after ruse after ruse. Um, they're, 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 there's, there's no frontier. Uh, and they get each other. Okay. Uh, and, and the fact that they're fighting all the time, they're, they're screwing up human beings. Well, look at look, look at what happens to um, uh, Telesius. There are many versions of these, but the, the one that seems to work for now is there's an argument between who and um, who. It's about love. Um, no, sex. Who enjoys sex more, male or females? That's the question. Well, they ask, Teresius. Okay. And so Teresius becomes her hermaphroditic and tries both and says, if I remember correctly, men enjoy sex more. Well, that pisses off the female god. Okay. And she makes him blind. Okay. She blinds him. And the other god, with a certain amount of symmetry, makes him a seer okay. in the future. Okay. 
like that before. And so he's all he's all fucked up. He's twisted and all this kind of thing, you know. But he plays, you know, he he, he plays some interesting parts and in, say an Oedipus, you know, Oedipus Rex. Um, so that's what happens to people <laughs> <laughs> when they're caught when they're caught between, you know, and in, in everyday life you get into those arguments. Uh, I mean, Lacan just you know continued that story, so to speak. Um, and no matter what you say, you're in trouble. So and that's good. It, it keeps everything <coughs> moving and, and not um, falling down and, and creating ground that we can slip on. But how does that have to? Uh, how does that bring it back to pagans in this kind of continuous process of bruises or bruising? Well, <coughs> there are no criteria to be successful. You don't know what the truth of the matter is. You don't know if you act in this way or this way or this way what the outcomes are. God would know. He's omniscient. By definition, is omniscient. Okay. The the the. Um, I mean, can you imagine what it's like? The strange incident uh, prescription that you find yourself in when God says to um, Abraham, "Go kill your kid." Basically, okay. He doesn't. And, and but the first law is obey me. Whatever I tell you to do. I mean, can you? I mean, there are people who hear those voices today and they kill the kids. So how do you tell the difference between those? You don't. You can't. You know, this is a tragedy of life. We, we, what we have is negative knowledge. We can't know. There's many things we can't know about. There's no way to, for us to be able to resolve because we don't have, you know, uh, a metalinguistic position from which to see. And, and yes? Okay, so I have a question, and it might be completely off. So That's good. Uh, preface this by just saying that I'm just trying to understand this from the pers uh, perspective of the uh, phenomenological framework of mental illness. And again, I'm sorry, I keep bringing this up. No, I love up. mental illness. Okay. It's, okay. it's, and that, and it's some of the most interesting. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to my classmates that I keep bringing up schizophrenia, and mm -hmm. they're probably tired of hearing it. Um, mm -hmm. But I um, just want to flesh it out with regard to what their role is in this, this game of rhetoric, this game of... Um, so on page 96, he talks, he says, actually 96 and 98, um, 96, he says, it's madness to know the just. And he talks about the terror and the absence of totality. And on page 98, it's a bit longer quote, uh, he says, and that means that the partners, the people who are assigned their roles by the language games in which they are caught occupy positions that are incommensurable to each other. Not only is there an incommensurability within a game between the position of a recipient and that of the utterer, for example, it is not always pronounced, but in its extreme in case of obligation, but from the game to game for the same position, there is incommensurability. It is not the same thing to be the recipient of a narrative and to be the recipient of a denote, denotative discourse with a function of truthfulness or to be the recipient of a command. And um, so earlier you prescribed the category of rhetoric as the three categories in the third category of rhetoric, as if it can be known, it cannot be communicated, to which Leotard prescribes it as to turn a nothing, the, we were talking about not a... Mm -hmm. it, it comes from nothing. It comes from nothing. And that nothing could be everything that was excluded as mm -hmm. nothing excluded Good. all thirds. And the compossibilities. Anyway, so to me, the schizophrenic seems to embody this compossibility cognitively. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Point to the point of overabundance of ideas and truths whereby his affectation inhibits his ability to partake in any language game of discourse. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the creativity theories, uh, theorists, um, Louis Sass, who is um, positing a position against traditional psychoanalysis for creativity in the schizophrenic, um, he says, I agree that persons who merit a schizophrenic diagnosis are seldom successfully creative, at least in the eyes of the world. However, this does not hold for the schizophrenia spectrum conditions, nor should one assume there is nothing at least potentially creative about the thinking of many persons with schizophrenia itself. Accomplishment may well be due to the factors that are distinct from creativity or creative potential. So with regard to this, I feel that language is a form of productivity. It is a form of that creative accomplishment from the mind to out, out of the body. And what happens when language can't be uttered due to the polymorphous of the id or I don't know if that's connected, connected to the paganism, but all these this primitive affectation within his body that he sees maybe too much that he can't synthesize it into language, but then turns it into different modes of creative production, like art or music or other forms. 
does this contribute to the language gain or mimesis, and to what extent can it also be considered um, as part of it when uh, when its origins are rooted in a disassociated structure of the game? Mm -hmm. So is he playing the game when he's... Who's he? Uh, the schizophrenic. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, oh, and, and one more quote, sorry. Um, the game is playing him, but let's go. Okay. Go ahead. You were going to say something else. Um, just the... the, the there's a quote on the perceptual stance in which a person desists from applying normal action-oriented perceptual schemata to experience both this mode of hypoconcentration that transforms the world into a vast museum of strangeness. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say this before we start talking about schism. Okay. Um, schisms. Okay, let's. Uh, it, it, it's very easy to sentimentalize them, romanticize them. Oh, how cool they are! Uh, it's a tremendous amount of pain that they are in, and um, it's, it's something I, that I think that most of us know. Okay, if you've ever been around someone who's really been diagnosed as schizophrenic, paralyzed, as can be. <coughs> so when Deleuze and Guattari, well, let me back up. When Foucault writes the preface to Anti Oedipus, he calls it a book of ethics. Do you recall that? I want you to someday when you get home, go back and read the preface. It's an incredibly powerful preface to Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus. Um, it's a book of ethics. And ethics is concerned with the good person, the good man, the good woman, the good etc. Okay. What, whatever it is that might be good. Um, and, they, and he says other things too that are just you know, some of the best writing of his and his writing is great. Okay, so that's there. But um, one of the things that um, the Lizard Watery state right up front is um, in terms of schizos, what they're running for, schizos refuse to be um, negated, to be placed under negation, suffer from negativity. They refuse that, they resist it. Mm -hmm. They resist in a. In, for Deleuze and Guattari, they're, you know, they're, um, they don't care for Lacan in that particular book because they say that Lacan and other psychoanalysts are trying to edipalize schizos. And schizos refuse to be edipalized. Now, if we could figure out how that works, okay, that, would be, that would be a major game, I would think, in terms of Leotard's um, program without a program. Um, and then there's this famous line, don't break down, break through, break out. In other words, don't, you know, romanticize this and, 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 and make yourself sick and uh, have a, a breakdown, okay? No, what you do is we study this and we use it as a breakthrough, okay? And so, you know, a lot of those illnesses that men and women suffer from, you know, in psychoanalysis are not looked at except by theorists who are analysts. And as I mentioned before, Lacan has all of his um, crazy women. Clement refers to them as crazy women. Clement was his, his student who wrote an autobiography, a critical autobiography. But Jacques Lacan, the, the story of the hero, or something like that. And she's telling, she's, she opens up the book talking to her daughter, telling her daughter about Jacques Lacan. Normally, you know, he's dumped on, and, and, and he should be, we should all be. Um, that's about the best that I can do right now, okay? But um, that would um, be a kind of paganism in which you're not separate gods living with other gods. You're all the gods. You're being torn in all of these, you know, in all of these different directions. That's what he keeps referring to as incommensurable. There's no way. They just don't fit together. And so they're fragmented. And they are, uh, they su strongly suggest that they're not one sex, you know. They're what? Not one sex, but multiple sexes. Okay. Sexes that we haven't even dreamed of yet. Um, because there's such an, a, a splintering, such an explosion of different, yes, is the situation is that of compossibility. You refer to that, didn't you? So there are all these characters, you don't know whom you're talking with at a particular point in time. You, know? you ever been around somebody like that? Where they, their voice changes? Mm -hmm. And you know, their eyes change and their stare changes. And then they go back, you know, and you begin to think, is a double personality here? Or a triple? And they're not doing it, you know, 
blow your mind and something like that. You know, you do it on a regular basis. Did you have a question? Okay. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. If it doesn't, we can we can continue Definitely. after dinner or whatever. Others. So I mean, basically, what they're doing is they're going to the ad norm, not the norm. Scientists, social scientists, look for the norm. They norm people, uh, so they can get somewhat get stable responses. But it's the ad norm. They can judge surely. Um, so I thought we would pick up and spend, you know, some. Time in the text, or is, are there any passages that you would like to begin with? I'm going to take it sequentially, but if you want to hop around, that's fine with me. Do you understand what's going on on page 38? Uh, let's, no, let's look at page 29 and 30 because he's talking about modernity there and will. W I L L. I want you really to get this, it's really important. Um, page 29 and 30. I stand at the bottom of page 29. JFL says, I am talking about the emergence of, the, of enunciation itself from the cogito or the ballo, and without distinguishing between the two, whether in Descartes or elsewhere, uh, uh, and in Rousseau no less explicitly, but in a different way, we are dealing with a notion that does not exist in Plato, the ability that you call the will in general, and that I would rather call the enunciating capability. Um, jump down to um, the last four exchanges. Jeff, absolutely. Within this problematic, one will say that a statement is just if it can be uttered by all the wills. Now it's plural. And as much as in uttering it, these wills do not alienate their freedom. Now that is crucial, do not. The wills, all the wills, have got to come together and create a description. What is Nietzsche talking about in terms of wills to power? Well, you know, he says will to power. But if you read him very carefully, he's talking about wills to power. They're, they're not in concert with each other. There's all, there is every, just, you know, to start with, every contradiction possible, okay? Every misspelling possible. It's like being in Borges' library of animals, okay? Where you get, well, where's the book? Which one is Proteus again? When is Proteus Proteus? You know? when, is, when do I know when he appears that he's really Proteus? And he's not being all these other things that he can be. You can't know that, okay? So this is wills to power. What do the Nazis do when they get willed? The leader, I will will. That's the terrible th time of when you take a prescription and you turn it into um, a description. You freeze it. When you take a, a one person's prescription and you freeze it into a description and, and, and um, silence everybody else. To the point of, well, just kill it. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about politics. He says, this a page, I'm going to show you that page you're not going to read. <laughs> oh, that, that's at the end of the fifth day. Yeah, yeah, tell me the page, please. Um, ah, it's on page 55. Oh. This is just, I mean, this should, should I mean, I'm sure people are reading this. If I do, I'm sure this fell out of his chair. <laughs> Look, I like the bad news, so please don't listen. Um, atop of page 55, it is in this sense that I do uh, lost my, uh, not believe myself to be a philosopher. What? In the proper sense of the term but a politician. But this term remains to be defined 
the meaning of the word politician must be completely overhauled. And such an overhauling would consist in thinking of all discourses as moves in language games. Do you see? So he's talking about, the whole book is about how do you determine the just? And how do you, or how do you determine justice? And so then you get, the, you get the image of the scales, where people in general will agree they're like this, and they're tilted. And so what's the tear, T-A-R-E, that you're going to put here okay, to compensate? It's all about compensation. It's like when a doctor is giving you five drugs. He starts out giving you the one drug, and that causes a problem. So he gives you another drug to counter that, that drug. And then that causes a tertiary problem, and he gives you another drug. You know, it's, it's, it, it, that's compensation. It's craziness, basically. Mm -hmm. So, oh, you might want to jot down, uh, down these uh, sentence, uh, page numbers. That's on page 29 and 30. Um, and he gives us uh, the Levinas discussion is on page 22. I refer to this, and I'm quoting, as, as a prescriptive situation in which the other, capital O, is talking to you and saying something to you that puts you in the strange, strangest places. Strangeness is a condition of listening. You listen. You just listen. And that's the second game, the Moses game. On page 24, there is a statement. He's reminding us constantly the just is not the same game as the true. So the pagan game, the just game, and so on. And then there's the game of the truth, the game of traditional philosophy. And it's very interesting, I didn't say anything about this to you in terms of context. We talked about the particular works that um, Leotard was using by Aristotle, the rhetoric, the Nicomachean ethics, the politics, etc. Okay. Um, when Aristotle divides everything up into threes. Plato is talking about the good, the, the true, the good, the beautiful. Plato. Aristotle Known, doing, making. Um, Kant, um, pure reason, practical reason. chooses, I mean, uh, Eliotor chooses, among this canon, you have the works on theoretical knowledge, you have the works on pedagogy, um, practice, um, praxis, and, and you have um, uh, the works on uh, construction, making things. Okay. Uh, and this is what he chooses, this is what Leotor chooses, this one. Okay. Uh, and also, just one, poetics. 
this is um, rhetoric. And I think that um, the Nicomachean and the ethics goes in. Because these cannot be theorized. That is made, you know, absolutely certain. But this is what he's using. He's not using this for traditional philosophy, but we go here. Yeah. Uh, in order to talk about, oh, in the politics is here. Yeah. Um, so this is what he's concerned with because he's not, he doesn't want to be a philosopher the way philosophers have been traditionally. Yes. Uh, but he wants to um, be, as he says, in quotes, a politician. And, that, and a sophist. He says he is a sophist. But that word, too, has been you know, damaged by Plato down to the to, um, to present. Um, so there are a lot of people who have, have uh, explained it uh, quite differently. Um, not, and not talking about all um, sophists. And as, as I said be, before lunch, the word sophist is not uh, a genus, nor is it a species, because it's misused. It's just everyone. You know, it's, it, it, there's equivocation after equivocation after equivocation, which makes it a rich word, because then it can be used in lots of different <laughs> But anyway, this is what I want you to see. And then we talked about pure reason and practical reason. And when, when Kant gets over here in terms of judgment or aesthetics, the beautiful, then all of a sudden what pops out of nowhere is a disfigurement. Remember Distor's figure? The figure will always refigure the discourse. So I'm going to ask you this question now about your relationship with language. In general, humans speak language. And boy, aren't they cool. They're better than all the other animals. Okay. But there is the proposition Everything is imminently reversible. The language speaks humans. What did Freud find out? What did Evans find out? He's blurting out things. What, what did Freud find out? This thing about the unconscious mind. And then there is something like the slip of the tongue, the slip of the pen, and stuff, where you say something. Or you might do something like this. Um, no, 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 I, no, I can't do that. No, yeah. and, and, and you don't know what you're doing. Or you're sending double, uh, it's a double articulation of some kind. Or it's like C note, yes or no. Uh, but anyway, this, what happens here is the sublime, the uncountable, mathematics cannot control it. It's infinity all at once, and it just backs up. Does that in 